Hello. Welcome to a podcast on the law and its impact on computing technology and business. This is Brian Gaff. I'm a senior member of the IEEE and partner at the McDermott Will and Emery Law Firm in Boston. The IEEE is presenting this podcast in conjunction with my column that appears each month in Computer Magazine, a publication of the IEEE's Computer Society. That column discusses legal issues relevant to people in the computer hardware, software, networking, and service businesses. In the last podcast, I discussed some corporate risks involving the use of social media. This podcast will discuss some of the recent major court decisions in intellectual property, or IP, which is the topic of my February 2014 column in Computer Magazine. 2013 was a significant year for IP. The last part of the new patent law became effective, and several courts issued decisions that had significant impact on IP law. Important cases involving patent law, copyright law, and trademark law were heard, rulings were issued, and in some instances, appeals taken. In several cases, appeals were taken to the U.S. Supreme Court, which has agreed to hear some of them in the 2014 term. This means we should expect decisions in those cases by June 2014. In the area of patent law, the Supreme Court has agreed to hear the appeal in the Nautilus v. Biosig case, which involves heart rate monitors for exercise equipment. The patent owner, Biosig, sued Nautilus for infringement. Nautilus tried to invalidate the patent using the re-examination process at the U.S. Patent Office, but was unsuccessful. The district court found that the patent's use of the phrase, quote, spaced relationship, unquote, was indefinite and therefore invalidated the patent. Biosig appealed that decision to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which reversed the district court. Nautilus then appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, which agreed to hear the case. The central issue in this case relates to the degree of ambiguity acceptable in patent claims. U.S. patent law, specifically Section 112B, requires that claims particularly point out and distinctly claim the subject matter. However, anyone that has read a patent knows that most claims are somewhat ambiguous to ensure that they have broad coverage and, if litigated, that they could reasonably be interpreted to cover as much as possible. In fact, a legal doctrine known as the doctrine of equivalence is designed to expand the scope of claims in certain situations. Someone accused of infringement who tries to invalidate patent claims because of their ambiguity, has an uphill battle. This is because issued patents are, by statute, presumed to be valid. Also, the evidence needed to invalidate a patent must meet the so-called clear and convincing standard. Now, that's a standard which is more than the preponderance of evidence standard, which means a better than 50% likelihood, but it's less than the beyond a reasonable doubt standard that's used in criminal cases. All of this has created a tension over where to draw the line on claim ambiguity. The Federal Circuit has adopted the rule that ambiguity is acceptable only to the extent that the claims aren't, quote, insoluble, unquote. Insoluble means that a reasonable claim interpretation won't result in a definition that's not sufficiently clear for the skilled artisan. The issue for the Supreme Court is whether that rule ignores the requirements that claims particularly point out and distinctly claim the subject matter. In other words, how far can one push the envelope with ambiguous claims without running into the Section 112 buzzsaw? One reason this case is interesting is because a decision from the Supreme Court will, in fact, draw a line on when claims can be ambiguous and when they can't be. If the Supreme Court directly addresses that issue, it will have significant effect on how patent claims get drafted, that is how patent attorneys put their claims together to best cover an inventor's invention, and if in fact the Supreme Court requires much more specificity in claims, one effect might be to see patents with many more claims in them than the usual number, just to ensure that they get the most coverage possible. Stay tuned for the results on this case, again expected sometime in June 2014. 
Another case that's found its way to the Supreme Court involves a trademark matter. Palm Wonderful is a company that sells pomegranate juices and pomegranate juice mixes. After the Coca-Cola company introduced a pomegranate juice product that contained only 0.3% pomegranate juice, Palm sued, claiming that Coca-Cola engaged in false advertising. Palm claimed that Coca-Cola's labeling of its product as a pomegranate product violated the Lanham Act, which prohibits a false or misleading description or representation about any goods. The Lanham Act includes the U.S. federal laws on trademarks. And as you might know, a purpose of a trademark is to define the origin or identify a product. The district court in California ruled that Palm couldn't challenge Coca-Cola's labeling under the Lanham Act. It reasoned that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's regulations on juice labeling controlled. In other words, that one couldn't use the Lanham Act to overrule the FDA regulations. Palm appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Palm did not go to the Federal Circuit because the Federal Circuit handles patent matters. As a trademark matter, Palm appropriately appealed to this, the appeals court in its jurisdiction. The Ninth Circuit agreed with the district court. Palm then appealed to the Supreme Court, which agreed to hear the case. Here, the main issue for the Supreme Court is whether a private party who is likely to be damaged, or who is damaged, Palm in this case, can use the Lanham Act to challenge a product label regulated by the FDA. The Lanham Act authorizes lawsuits, but this creates a conflict with other federal statutes under which the FDA operates. Conflicts like this occur occasionally. For example, advertisements relating to medical devices must comply with FDA requirements, and prior attempts to use the Lanham Act to control those advertisements have been unsuccessful. The Supreme Court will consider the argument that both the Lanham Act and FDA requirements can coexist. In other words, do the FDA regulations set a minimum level of compliance, and then the Lanham Act requirements build upon that, to prevent misleading labeling. This is a very interesting question. It is a conflict of laws type of issue that the Supreme Court handles from time to time. And again, a decision on this is expected by June 2014. Some copyright cases of interest also were decided in 2013. They're not at the Supreme Court. They were decided by lower courts, but they're interesting nonetheless. Briefly, the first one is the Capitol Records versus Redigi case. This is a case involving the ability of a person who owns a digital copy of a song to be able to resell it to somebody else after the first person purchases it. Similar to an instance where, with older technology, one would buy a compact disc and then later sell it to a used record store or just sell it to an acquaintance. The issue here was that could that ability to resell, sometimes called the first sale doctrine or exhaustion, does that extend to digital copies or digital files? And the court ruled no, that once a person purchases a digital file, that he cannot resell it unfettered. There is no opportunity to do that under the current law. This is a very interesting case. I think we will see more of these types of cases as time goes on because it does create a tension with persons' ability to resell their possessions. And when is that permissible and when is it not permissible? Another interesting case in the copyright area is the Authors Guild versus Google case. This is a case involving Google's desire to scan massive numbers of books and create a large digital library of all of these works so as to make them searchable for research purposes, etc. Many book publishers and authors object to that because they feel that as the copyright owners, they can control how their products are used to a certain extent, and this action of scanning 
is not acceptable under the copyright law. However, copyright law does include certain exceptions where pro copyrighted items can, in fact, be used fairly, and it's called the fair use doctrine. And there are several criteria that determine whether someone's use of a copyrighted product is in fact fair use and therefore is not an infringement of a copyright. In this instance, the court ruled that the book scanning was in fact a fair use and that the copyright owners had no recourse on that. Another copyright case of I think particular interest to engineers is the Goldie Blocks versus Island Def Jam Music Group copyright case. This is a case involving the use, almost a parody, of a Beastie Boys song by the Goldie Blocks Company, which manufactures toys and educational materials to help girls in science, technology, and engineering education to basically help convince girls to become engineers. And what Goldie Blocks did is take a Beastie Boys song from several years ago with the title Girls and change the lyrics somewhat and put it to a video to promote their product and demonstrate to girls that they should consider engineering as a career or at least a path of study. And Island Def Jam Music and the Beastie Boys sued for copyright infringement, not claiming that they do not authorize any commercial use of their songs for advertising purposes and forced wanted to force Goldie Blocks to stop using the the um, song. The lawsuit, which actually was initiated by Goldie Blocks after threats from Island Def Jam, is currently pending in California. There is uh, a fair amount of discussion about it as to whether this is actually fair use because it is something of a parody of the original song. On the other hand, there is an argument that it is being used as an advertisement by Goldie Blocks, and because of that, that's not fair use. That is a revenue-generating tool. So that case is still pending. It may be resolved by settlement sooner rather than later. However, it is still an active matter and an interesting one to watch. These and other cases, some of which are discussed in my February column, represent some of the interesting cases in IP in 2013. Um, there are many decisions that the courts are expected to issue in 2014 that will have significant impact on IP law. The corresponding changes in the law could very well have a significant effect on many businesses and how they operate. In the forthcoming podcasts, for Computer Magazine, I'll be discussing those decisions as they are issued. So stay tuned for those podcasts. Until next time, this is Brian Gaff. Feel free to contact me via email at bgaff at mwe.com. Thank you.